Next, we have Francisco uh, Trujillo. I had to practice this, so I'm sorry. We talked about the pronunciation of his name, Tru Tru Trujillo. I have to get the, rather than Trujillo, which is how I, uh, my little Spanish is Argentine Spanish, so it's a little different. Anyway, is anyway Frank Trujillo is associate book conservator in the Thor Conservation Center at the Morgan Library and Museum. He holds a master's degree. Uh, in uh, Library and Information Science and an Advanced Certificate in Conservation from the University uh, uh, of Texas at Austin. Uh, and he studied for his first degree at the University of Notre Dame. His research has focused on the materials and techniques of medieval manuscripts, um, French Romanesque binding structures, and the Coptic bindings collection at the Morgan Library. And it's those uh, those things that he's going to talk to us about this afternoon in his talk with the title Incipient Forms, Codicology of the Coptic Bindings Collection at the Morgan Library and Museum. Please welcome Frank Francis Franci Francisco. I have him down here all these ways. Trujillo. Thank you, Ivan. Um, I do go by a lot of names, so you can call me whatever you want. Uh, thank you, Georgia, uh, for the invitation and for the beautiful exhibition. And um, thanks to the Bard um, Graduate Center. They put on a great spread and um, a really wonderful exhibition. Um, so to begin, <coughs> and I'm, <coughs> I'm actually getting over a cough and a cold, so if I keep drinking water, I apologize. To begin, I quote from Theodore Peterson's unpublished manuscript, Coptic Book Bindings, in the Pierpont Morgan Library. Quote, in discussing the historical beginnings of the Codex, several writers have stressed the fact that it was Roman writers of the August period who gave us the first reports on the existence of parchment codices. And from this, they have concluded that the techniques of lengthwise book sewing must have originated in Rome, probably with the parchment books described by Marshall in the first century AD. There's a footnote at the end of this line from Theodore Burt's 1913 essay, and for my German, I apologize to Dirk, Handbuch der Altertus Wissenschaft. Quote, the really ingenious feature of the invention of the codex was its choir arrangement. There's no evidence to indicate that sewing in choirs was invented at Pergamum. In the times of Marshall, parchment was used only in rolled form. It seems, therefore, quite possible that the invention was made in the city of Rome itself, where the first mention of it occurs. Its inventor possibly was the very Secundus, Freed's former slave of Lucensis, who resided in Rome behind the Temple of Peace and the Forum of Nerva, and at whose shop alone in the days of Marshall such length lengthwise sewn parchment books were for sale. Which is incredibly specific, but if you needed some parchment, it'd be right there, right there. Go to the Forum and make a left. Um, Roger Powell, with regard to the structure of the Stonyhurst Gospel, now known as the St. Cuthbert Gospel of St. John, wrote, Speculation is a fascinating and honorable pastime. Its danger lies in repetition by quotation until what started out as the expression of an uninquiring mind becomes lost in a jungle of footnotes and cross-references to emerge as accepted fact. The Powell quote is from Vanessa Claire Marshall's 1993 PhD dissertation titled, The Development of Bookbinding Structures in the Early Middle Ages During the Period Century 3 to Century 910, as evidenced by extant binding structures from Egypt and Western Europe, in which Marshall travels fully and well many of the themes and dusty roads of this talk. I should say as fully as she was allowed, because at the time of her dissertation, her request to see the firsthand the almost 50 bindings at the Morgan Library and Museum that comprised the Coptic binding collection was denied due to their deteriorated state. Fortunately, for all of us gathered for the symposium and exhibition, Georgios was allowed to see the bindings and borrowed some for this exhibition. In the Morgan's defense, the bindings are incredibly fragile and much work has been done in the past 25 years to stabilize and rehouse the collection. Maria Fredericks, will discuss the history of the conservation of the Coptic book bindings. Um, I will be exploring some of the reasons the collection is important to book historians and book binding history through the lens of Theodore C. Peterson. I must admit that this talk may not lead us directly to the parchment shop behind the Temple of Peace in the Forum of Nerva, 
but I am hopeful that it will provide a bookbinding history that is filled with more fact than speculation. Theodore Peterson's unpublished manuscript is an examination of the Coptic book bindings at the Morgan Library, acquired between 1911 and 1920. When J. Pierpont Morgan acquired in 1911 from the Paris art dealer Arthur Sambon a large collection of Coptic manuscripts, he formed the largest collection of such manuscripts that had a known provenance. In 1916, J. P. Morgan Jr. Formed, uh, added four parchment manuscripts and one papyrus manuscript, all of them in leather bindings. In 1920, two further purchases of Coptic materials added fragments of two leather bindings. A final purchase in 1921 included remnants of three more bindings. Peterson's work comprises an introduction on early Coptic book binding methods, a description of 50 Morgan Coptic book bindings, and 50 Coptic bindings in collections in European and Egyptian libraries. Peterson assembled the knowledge of his day both from first-hand observation and from published resources which tended to provide more about decoration with minimal details about materials and structure. He identified at least 50 more Coptic bindings in libraries in England, Europe, and Egypt. Peterson's relationship with the Morgan Library began in 1929 when he was hired as an assistant to Dr. Henry Hivernot to work on a catalog raisonné of the Coptic find. He was paid $100 a month for his work. Hivernot was the main intermediary, <coughs> intermediary between the manuscripts and the library. Peterson was a professor and priest at Catholic University in Washington, D.C. He specialized in ancient languages and history. During the course of his work on the catalog raisonné, he became interested in writing about the binding structures. A gifted draftsman, he drew many of the covers and structures, and those drawings became the basis for his manuscript on the bindings. He was not versed in bookbinding history and terminology. Some of the, his first books about bookbinding structures were provided by the P Pierpont Morgan Library, including one titled, a rod for the back of the binder, the reception of which prompted him to thank the Morgan and say that the book will, quote, furnish me with a number of unfamiliar technical terms for description of the Coptic bindings, end quote. As can be seen on the screen, his efforts stretched from 1929 to 1958, but the manuscript has never been published. Rather, it has existed in Samizdat among binders and researchers since 1958. There have been a few efforts since then to edit and publish the manuscript but to date, they have not been successful. The contents of the manuscript included book sewing, book covers, hinging of covers, head banding, decoration of covers, ornamentation of the leather coverings, clasps, book markers, tabs, and repair work. The latter half of this talk will detail some of Peterson's observations. I'd like to take a step back here to discuss just why Peterson's manuscript is important to book historians and book conservators. The manuscripts and bindings that form the collection were discovered in 1910 in a well in the village of Hamouli, approximately 60 miles southwest of Cairo in the Fayum Oasis. Purchased en masse in 1911 by Pierpont Morgan, the collection immediately became and remains the largest collection of Coptic manuscripts in the world from a single location. But manuscripts formed the library of the Monastery of St. Michael, a monastery that was unknown until the discovery of its library. The volumes dated from 822 to 914 AD based on colophons in the manuscripts, although some of the binding decorations may date from at least a century <coughs> earlier. The Morgan Coptic Collection forms the lar largest collection of early datable bindings in existence. The other Significant groups of manuscripts are in the Coptic Museum Cairo and about two dozen from the monastery of St. Mercurius near Edfu, Upper Egypt, dated between 979 and 1053 at the British Museum. One can see El Fayum there. Hamouli was about there. Um, and Edfu is here in the south, or Upper Egypt. <coughs> Peterson writes of the Hamouli find, 50 book bindings dug out of the sands of Egypt. Some 30 were fairly well preserved with their sewings mostly intact. 10 were torn off and badly damaged, but could without much difficulty be identified with the volumes to which they belonged. The remaining 10 bindings were only partially preserved and could not be identified with any particular manuscripts in the Coptic find. Major elements in the, in the design, structure, and materials of the Coptic book have appeared in Ethiopic, Byzantine, Armenian, and Islamic bookbinding traditions. In 
It should be remembered also that the Coptic excavation sites, where all the newly discovered relics of earliest book bindings have been found, were not large and wealthy centers of population, but generally small towns, villages, and monasteries skirting the edge of the desert and too poor to import the luxury goods of Alexandria and Rome. The bindings speak to this point. They are of brown leather, likely goat, pasted over bookboards, of laminated papyrus, strips of cloth, and plant matter. They are simple when one speaks of their constituent parts, but those same simple pieces form one of the earliest types of bookbinding traditions known. The lack of luxury goods also comes to mind when considering the precursors to the leather bindings over papyrus boards found at Humuli. While there may be over 100 total Coptic bindings of the 9th and 10th centuries in collections around the world, there are less than 10 wooden board bindings in worldwide collections. On the screen is MSG67, the Morgan Library's Glacier Codex. Purchased in 1961 by William S. Glacier, it was deposited at the Morgan in 1963 after his untimely death and ultimate, ultimately gifted to the library by the trustees of Mr. Glacier's estate. The volume is a Coptic manuscript of the Acts of the Apostles dated to the fifth or sixth century and has some of the features that evolve when they are found in the Hamuli bindings of the ninth and 10th centuries. Some of those features include the bone pegs and leather wrapping bands. The great condition of the binding and manuscript prompted some questions about its authenticity, but those have been allayed through carbon dating of the leather strapping. One of the defining features of the Glacier Codex is the decorated spine lining and the method of attachment of the spine lining to the wooden boards. The wooden boards are made of wood from the acacia tree, similar to the wood found on the small number of wooden board bindings worldwide. Wood is not a natural resource in abundance in Egypt. As the physical size and production of codices increased between the 5th and 9th centuries, coinciding with the rise of monastic establishments throughout Egypt, papyrus, ever abundant, was used to make the bookboards. I take the description of the attachment of the leather boards in the Glacier Codex from Paul Needham's 12 centuries of book bindings in which it is catalog number one. Quote, the special oddity of this binding style is the complicated system by which the boards and leather spine were joined together. Leather hinging strips were passed through slits in the back strip and then laced through, the hole, through holes in the boards, their ends terminating under the paste downs. End quote. Descriptions and diagrams like, the, like Needham's here are like manna to bookbinders. They're poured over with Talmudic, Talmudic fervor, speculated upon, and recreated via models. A fine one can be seen in Giorgio's exhibition. The scarcity of early bookbinding examples and the fact that they form the vanguard of bookbinding structures make their construction and their influence important to the bookbinding historian. The Glacier Codex is one of only a handful of wooden board bindings. You can see the extension of the spine lining in the image at top. One asks, why is that shaped and decorated piece of leather needed? What tools were used to create it? How did the sewing pattern of the codex, as seen in the lower image, come about? A one-of-a-kind wooden board binding is the decorated Washington Manuscript of the Gospels from the Freer Gallery in Washington, D.C. Though this is a binding on a Greek manuscript, it is bound in Egypt in a similar fashion as the Glacier Codex. It was purchased in 1906 and was documented, documented by Theodore Peterson and included in his bookbinding manuscript. Based on the physical evidence, he created this depiction of the possible original structure of the binding. There are many more attachment points for the leather wrapping bands, and there is a bookmarker at the top right corner. Many more um, attachment points than the Glacier Codex. It's possible, even likely, that the paintings of the four evangelists on the wooden board covers were done some, sometime after the original binding. Following this line of thought, the wrapping bands, as they wound and unwound from the book, would have rubbed off the paintings. If, indeed, the paintings were done at a later date, perhaps the 7th or 8th century, the depictions would dovetail with a fragment of an early leather binding at the British Museum. This fragment is from the 8th century leather Coptic book binding, is from an 8th century leather Coptic book binding, and is described by A.F. Shore in the British Museum Quarterly in 1971, thusly. It is the subject of Christ Emmanuel surrounded by the four evangelists. The technique of de decoration of the binding is elaborate. A sheet of leather, gilded on its upper surface, was used as the ground for a painted composition. In order to protect the painting, a thin sheet of parchment was placed over the full width of this panel. 
Narrow strips of leather were then stitched around the outlines of the figures, decorative patterns, and lettering producing an embossed surface. The needle pierced the parchment, gilt leather, and also a piece of linen used as a backing. The panel was then attached to a larger sheet of leather, the larger sheet, with the decorated panel securely stitched to it, and possibly also glued, was used to cover the boards of the back cover for a binding. Fibers of papyrus still adhering to the underside show that the boards were of this material. This description of the technique of decoration in the eighth century can be used to describe the decoration of MSM 569, the Morgan Library's Four Gospels, the high point of decoration in the Coptic binding collection. The cover is composed of layers of gilt leather, parchment, and pierced leather colored with a transparent or organic red dye. The red leather cutwork, or tracery, is interwoven with strips of parchment and so sewn to a layer of leather covered with gold leaf, which creates a radiant background for the design elements of the tracery. The binding and manuscript date to the 9th century, but the red leather de decoration is from at least a century earlier and has been repurposed to decorate the binding. Extant examples of the same technique of pierced leather to decorate bindings are extremely rare and are no longer on a book binding. This example from the Austrian National Library was also excavated from the Fayum and dates to the 8th or 9th century. The dating of the of the technique is based on a similarity, similarity to Coptic footwear, the finest examples of which are probably the beautifully decorated shoes, boots, and slippers found in the necropolis of Akmim, currently on view in the exhibition. Whereas MSM 569 and the binding fragment in Austria have an applique of gilt leather and tracery laid onto the leather of the cover, the decoration of this Coptic bookbinding fragment in the Egyptian Museum Berlin has been cut directly into the covering leather. It is integral to the binding itself, not applied. Although a distinction can be made between the two techniques, it's a distinction being made based on a very small sample size of the two book covers on M569 and the last two leather fragments of bindings that I just showed. The value of Peterson's study is that it evaluates 50 bindings and draws conclusion on a larger sample size of the same provenance which is not to say that everything he wrote is correct, but rather what he wrote provides the fullest picture of the binding techniques of the 9th and 10th century in Egypt. So I will now turn to what it was that Peterson wrote using some of the categories that he created using his own table of contents, as seen on this slide. Um, I'm gonna go over some book sewing, book covers, hinging of covers, the decoration of the covers, ornamentation of the leather coverings, and clasps. Of the Humuli bindings, 40 were sewn on with three stitches, three with four stitches, and two with two stitches. What Peterson means can be seen on the image at right. There are three linked chains of sewing, but there are two stitches between them. The linking of stitches was the key to allowing text blocks to go from only lengthwise sewing to vertical sewing. The text blocks were sewn with hempen cord and with two needles. Quote, if a two-stitch sewing, one with three chain link stitch bands, these are the one, two, three, had been decided on, three points would be marked upon the back of the choirs for the placing of the three thread holes. A cord with a needle at either end was then placed upon the back edge of choir A. He continues to meticulously detail the sewing pattern for two-stitch, three-stitch, and four-stitch sewing. The sewn parchment text blocks would then have been in need of book covers. The covers were made of laminated sheets of papyrus until they reached the desired thickness, generally between 8 to 15 millimeters. The papyrus pith, or circumference of the plant stock, could be one inch wide, as seen in this slide. So I, maybe you can make that out, which is, that's, that's one inch there, right there. Or the pith could be three and three to three and a half inches wide. And I think you can make out the three inches better on the left hand slide. So I think these go sort of vertically, so that's three inches there. Sometimes the book covers were made up of papyrus and crumpled parchment, 
and they could also be smeared with a flour paste, perhaps mixed with stucco or chalk, as seen on the right. In some instances, fragments of other bindings could be cobbled together to form a larger binding. Scraps of linen cloth were sometimes used between papyrus layers. The boards of MSM 599 contain between, uh, contain between a few outer layers of written papyrus leaves, uh, excuse me, contain between a few outer layers of written papyrus leaves a thick layer of stringy flax straw felted together and soaked in a dark paste or glue. The edge of the felted layers, which are sharply cut, seem to indicate that the boards were not made to size, but cut from a larger board that may have been originally intended for other uses. The backboard weighs more than three pounds. The sewn text block and the form covers would then need to be hinged together. Peterson has two theories of attachment. <coughs> One is the dilapidated condition of the fragments of the ancient sewing left adhering to the book covers makes it difficult now to determine in which particular bindings the boards were attached to their codices by means of a separate hinging operation after the books had been fully sewn as books without covers, and in which of them the lacing of the covers was affected in one continuous operation together with the sewing of the choirs. In some bindings, the cords used in the lacing of the hinging catches are seen to be identical with those used in the sewing of the choirs. This drawing by Peterson depicts the hinging catches or eyes that were along the spine edge of the board onto which the sewing of the text block could be fastened. And I think he's talking about there's a sort of loop here and another loop here, this loop here. This side view of MSM 634 possibly shows the loops Peterson depicts. It is an open question whether the boards were sewn with the text block or attached using the hinging technique. The unsettled answer to that question, due to the lack of remaining physical evidence, is one of the reasons Peterson's manuscript is of such interest. After the papyrus boards had been properly hinged, the bookbinder placed <coughs> a piece of coarse linen over the back of the book in such a way that it overlapped the adjoining boards to the extent of from one to three inches. Here's the leather, I'm sorry. Linen, not leather. These overlapping flanges were then glued down onto the side of the boards. These linen backings protected the spine of the book and strengthened its hinges. The linen was not glued to the back of the spine of the parchment manuscript, a departure from the practice in wooden board bindings in which the leather was directly glued, glued to the manuscript. This change allowed for the freer movement of the manuscript within the binding. The decoration of the leather bindings took a variety of forms. They could have painted designs like this manuscript, MSM 601, though this is the only example of a design painted directly onto the leather. The yellow pigment has been tested and it is orpiment, an, an arsenic sulfide. The painting was done freehand with wavy lines and no precision. The decoration would have been done after the leather was glued over the papyrus board and the binding was finished. Tool, de tool designs would have been done before the leather covers were adhered over the boards. A folder made of bone, a stylus, or a chamfering tool, such as was used by shoemakers, may have been the instrument used. These two slides depict a similar design as on MSM 601, but tooled rather than painted. If there were parchment cutouts, the parchment would have been pasted to the back of the leather before any design cutouts were done. The parchment could be cut through completely or left solid as in the center of this cover to provide a contrast color. I can't quite make it out because it's faded, but this is parchment under the leather. Uh, orpiment was again used to color the exposed parchment designs. The leather uh, could additionally be paired to emphasize the line tooling. The line tooling could have been lost or diminished during the gluing process so the pairing would highlight the tooling. And that pairing is um, sort of this part here. <coughs> the binder could pair between lines rather than retool, which would have been more difficult to make perfect. An example of paired leather can also be seen on one of the shoes in the exhibition. After decoration and pasting of leather over boards, clasps were added to the bindings to keep the books closed. 
loops of braided leather would be inserted into the front board and corresponding bone pegs would be inserted into the body, bottom board. The binder would determine the appropriate length in order to keep the volume tightly closed. In this binding depicted, there were two straps at the top, here and here, three on the side and two on the bottom. And there would have been a corresponding two bone pegs here, three here, and two here. And I think these, um, didn't talk about some bookmarkers, but this would have been a bookmarker. Um, yes, the leather straps at the corners at angles may have been bookmarkers, such as the one depicted here in the Freer Gospels drawing. And in, in this instance, there would have been one in the front and one in the back. As evidenced by many of the slides, it's difficult to make out some of the decoration on the original bindings. One of the major visual contributions to our understanding of the bindings is Father Peterson's line drawings of many of the decorations. They are finely wrought and incredibly detailed. And in many instances, instances have more visual evidence than the artifact. Here you can see what all of the pegs would have looked like sticking out of the edges of MSM 569. In its current condition, the pegs have been pushed into the boards. And areas that have deteriorated, like the bottom of the leather on the left, can be much more easily seen in the line drawing. Through the artistry and scholarship of Father Peterson, the Coptic Bindings Collection at the Morgan Library Museum remains a vital source of information about the early history of bookbinding. Thank you. So questions for Frank Trujillo. Yes, at the back. Oh, sure. I should have. I should have said that. Actually, that four gospels that I kept showing, M five six nine. I think that's the only uh, gospel, four gospels in the collection. The rest is Acts. So the rest is just Acts. And uh, Bill, Bill Bokley could um, elaborate on that. But that's. Um, I keep going back to five six nine because it's so. For me, it's you know it's elaborately decorated, but um, the, the manuscripts themselves are mainly Acts. Peter, I hope this is not an embarrassing question, but um, you can start. Any idea why the manuscript was never published? <laughs> uh, it's had a sort of um, long and tortured history. Um, there was a there was a contract with Cambridge University Press. Um, there was a, a finished manuscript, and that was in 1951. And our director at the time, Frederick Adams, um, had taken it by the horns, and he had to write. He wanted to add some something to it. <laughs> And um, our archives indicate that nothing really happened for, I think the director gets busy. <laughs> and uh, nothing really happened for about seven years. And he wrote to the Cambridge University Press and said, you know what, this isn't really going to happen. Can we shelve this? And they said, sure, let us know. Um, John Sharp has uh, tr uh, edited um, the manuscript. And um, there were some efforts to uh, publish um, that as well. And I'm embarking on a publication, on an editing project and a publication, and hoping that I'll end the curse. But um, <laughs> and I'll tell you in about seven years. So. <laughs> and we'll hope it doesn't end up as a palimpsest. <laughs> <laughs> um, on one of them, you said that uh, the tool design was done before the leather was put on the boards. That's according Why to Peterson. Do oh, that's according to Peterson? Yeah. Because that would be so much harder to get it all I mean, to put the leather on, have the design first, and then put the leather on to get everything like lined up and everything. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, that's why, I mean, it's one of those. You don't necessarily agree. Um, <coughs> not necessarily. There's sort of, you can, you can see uh, yes, and you can see, see well, that isn't something that you would probably do now. The, the only thing that recommends it, really, is the, the papyrus. <coughs> so if you these would done, be done wet and a cold tool. And so if you have, the, you know, I think you think about tooling now and it's on wooden boards. So you have this sort of hard surface that you can really work into. And I think that um, the thing that does make sense is that if you have this laminated papyrus, um, even I don't, it, it's not that stiff. And I think that that maybe came into play. Yeah. 
And the geometry of it's easier to work out off the book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I mean, there's a lot to recommend it, and it, so th that's I think um, the, the the value of the, the manuscript itself, and in trying to trying to interpret it and trying to interpret the material is you know you approach it from your sort of modern sensibility, and you're like, why why would you do that? Um, but there are plenty of reasons. Why. And and again, you're, you're you're talking about the early history of bookbinding, so I think we we're talking about experimenting experimentation. Going crazy. Yeah, so. More questions? Yes? Um, did you see any evidence of a transferring the pattern onto the book? Like, was there any pricking or how it was marked out on the pattern? Uh, I haven't. And the, one of the issues is that they're pretty deteriorated. So, yeah. you know, what maybe a prick is also a <coughs> wormhole or, you know, so. <laughs> yeah. But I didn't. Yes, well, you alluded to me, but I guess I better answer the question yeah. about the contents. <laughs> uh, one of the remarkable things about this discovery, and initially 60 codices were found. By the time Morgan got informed, he was able to buy 50 of them. But what we're talking about uh, is virtually the entire contents of a 9th of a ninth century <coughs> monastic library. So this did have, as Frank said, a gospel book, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But there were also many lives of saints, uh, devotional texts, also in honor of the Virgin Mary, with some of the earliest depictions of the Virgo lockdowns in the history of art. So anyway, these are all on Corsair, so you can uh, find That's our catalog there. system at the Morgan Library. Right. Uh, and I can also recommend the book by Leo Dupuit, uh, who did the catalog of the text as a doctoral dissertation, which was itself an amazing accomplishment. He was at Brown University. But he analyzes all of the texts and where they're published in that monumental book. I should say that uh, Morgan had a real interest in Egypt. He went almost every year, and it was one of his travels there. <laughs> and did Dupuis take his name from the well? <laughs> well, uh, well, there were actually some other things perhaps found in the well that are of interest, including three writing boxes. Oh. Uh, and some of them included pens, and I'm waiting for someone to come forward to test the ink residue to see if some of those pens were in fact used, as I suspect they were, in the writing of some of those manuscripts. Yes, the fact. Was the fact that these things were found in the well indicate a desperate attempt to save something or a desperate attempt to destroy something? Uh, yes. Uh, <laughs> uh, it was suggested that they were being protected from an Arab, an Arab invasion, and the monks had to flee, uh, and they apparently couldn't take uh, the library with them, so they put them in this dry well, where they remained for about a thousand years, until 1910, when some Egyptians searching for tabak, a kind of natural fertilizer, <laughs> dug a little deeper, and they found this buried library. And water right there. <laughs> yeah, I, I wish Morgan would have gotten there a bit earlier, yeah. but about uh, uh, 10 of these things did escape. Uh, but uh, Morgan's son did publish a photographic uh, corpus of 63 volumes in which they gathered photographs of all the other parts that Morgan <coughs> didn't get. So that is itself uh, a valuable resource because it also shows the bindings and the manuscripts as they appeared in 1925, I believe it was. And he got them before uh, the, before they were burned, or else they'd be part of uh, Dirk's uh, copy. <laughs> <laughs> yes, the back. Um, just to go back to the earlier question about uh, whether we would know that the Old Testament was Uh, you know? We we I don't know of any that have, and um, we haven't scanned them. I, again, they are quite fragile. And one thing that did come to mind, though, is you know you see that design um, that's an orphan you know, per Perhaps that's maybe they they drew that on first, and then yeah. you know uh, punch that out or or use that for tooling, and then we're able to erase that. So um, you know maybe that isn't a finished uh, cover, which would lend credence to doing it on the book, though. But Time for one more question. Yes. Um, Frank, you, um, early on in your talk, you said something about um, 
these were very remote monasteries and um, not near to any major ports like Alexandria and as a way of explaining the materials that were used. But mm -hmm. I mean, it seems to me that actually the gilding with leather and you know using armament that actually the materials are were fairly expensive. So could you just comment for you on that? Um, you know, I've taken that information from from Peterson, and okay. I mean, I would. It does make sense, and I, I think um, it would be interesting to, to do a study of the sort of availability of natural resources in these remote areas, because, again, what may be um, um, a, a, it, it may be that there's a source, say, of orbiment near one of these places, right. um, and it's, but, but um, it's, it's, an, it's a good question. I, I don't know the exact answer, but Peterson the, the idea that he has of the mon of the, the world as it existed was the one that I, I described. Oh, I see. So you were quoting from him, basically. It was it, it, him and other resources. Right. Other sources. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Great. Yeah. yeah. But I, I can see. Yes, of course, the other side of the. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. More research. <laughs> well, it seems as though Father Peterson's work is a very uh, apt counterbalance to Edward Gibbon's skepticism about the the role of monks in late antiquity. Mm -hmm. So uh, I would also remind you that thanks to the generosity of the Morgan Library and Museum, the most spectacular of the, of the covers uh, that, that Frank showed us and talked about is on view in George's exhibition uh, in number 18. So if you've not seen that yet, that will be, this is your chance. So you can't touch that one. You can't <laughs> touch that one. <laughs> so let's thank uh, Frank Trujillo for his